Hello everyone, Zach here from the Carnival of Randomness on behalf of our sponsor, Opsitnik and Associates. In these unprecedented times, we reflect on our future, both in the next few weeks and months, but also the upcoming years and decades, and it's time to prepare for that future. Opsitnik and Associates has been contacted by many healthcare workers, as well as old and new clients, to prepare wills, powers of attorney, and advanced directives, also called a living will. All of you need these documents, so don't say you don't have any assets to speak of, no children or other dependents. Regardless of the circumstances now, you will need a will for today and tomorrow. Al Opsitnik feels so strongly about having wills and other needed documents prepared that Opsitnik and Associates can prepare your will, power of attorney, and living will at no charge, you heard that correct, no charge until the end of 2020. No hidden fees or gimmicks. Al feels so strongly about planning for the future at this time that he is willing to assist you with your future. Trust Opsitnik and Associates, attorneys for 42 years, from the Supreme Court to Alaska and everywhere in between. You can find them online, OpsitniksLaw.com, on Facebook, Opsitnik and Associates, or call them toll-free, 1-866-391-3299 to prepare for your future. Hi, everybody, and... It's 2020, so the Carnival of Randomness is coming to you just outside of the Twilight Zone. And I'm Rob, and with me is proof again that a drummer can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> hey, Greg. And our, Hi. And our guest this week, I describe his work as a virtual psychedelic cornucopia stew of beauty. It's, he brings up my favorite hero, Zontar, and one of my songwriting idols, Jeffrey Lee Pierce, among others. But we're very glad to have Kim Drayheim. Hi, Kim. I'll do. And you said you had a drummer joke, so I we do. have to torture Greg. <laughs> Here, here's my favorite drummer joke. Can't uh, wait. Uh, <laughs> this uh, band was, this drummer was really complaining because everybody in his band was really on him. And uh, he was pretty depressed about it. And he said, yeah, he says, everybody in the band says, says you know, you got to catch up with the beat. You're always late. You're always late. And it turns out he got so depressed about it, he threw himself behind a train. Oh! <laughs> I don't <laughs> oh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself for the audience out in podcast land? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm a member of the band, the Infrared Radiation Orchestra. Awesome band. Um, I play guitar. Um, <laughs> I I write songs. I'm one of the two, one of the three singers in the band. Uh, I've been yeah, this. Uh, I've been playing nonstop rock and roll, playing live, playing for money for 50 years. This was my 50th anniversary of playing out live. And in fact, one of the shows we had to cancel because of the uh, plague was um, a celebration of my 50 straight years in showbiz. And uh, hopefully we'll make that up after there's a vaccine. That's what I say. I tell people and... People who listen to this show fully are smart, so we don't have to get into the Illuminati forcing us to wear masks <laughs> to enslave us and make us all you know, serfs on the farm or whatever. But I basically think we have to try to be strong. We're in this together, and we have to wait for a vaccine. You can okay? surf on a farm? Sure. Oh, okay. Hey, whatever. I when I try to use big words, I worry this. <laughs> but what was then? What was your first gig? You remember? Uh, my first paying gig was uh, playing. Uh, I, I, my childhood home was right across the road from what is now the New York Chiropractic College in Seneca Falls but it was originally the um, it was originally Eisenhower Liberal Arts College and I uh, my first gig when I was 16 was playing in the student lounge over there for 50 bucks uh, solo my first uh, paying rock and roll gig was a year later with my first band Uptown Dog Food which I still maintain is possibly the greatest rock and roll band name of all time i would still if you made mm. shirts i would buy one <laughs> uh, i just found the poster from that very very first show which was a uh, german club dance at my high school and uh uptown dog food uh, uh we performed mostly cover tunes uh, uh some some fairly standard stuff uh, but we also did um the blimp by captain beefheart our big set closer was um uh, heroin by the Velvet Underground. Uh, we did a fair number of originals. Um, we were not a normal band. <laughs> um, 
and our and our our very last show, which was at um, oh, was it Union Springs High School or now this is really dating me back when I was a youngster and first starting out. High schools had a live band every weekend. Right. Every weekend there were gigs, often Friday and Saturday. The first time I played out live in a band, which was Uptown Dog Food, and we were horrible, we were paid $650 to play for 90 minutes. And I remember being angry because our friends in the band Sleaze got $1,000 when they played a dance at our high school. That's wow. what that's what bands used to get paid back then. <laughs> I did one at uh, my high school too, Carney. I don't know, if it, Andy, were you there? You might have been there. <laughs> um, yeah, we I think we got four hundred, but it was only because I was tight with somebody in the student council, and I got in there. We had my band feedback did one at that. Back either. then, when <laughs> back then when there was no competition from things like video games or home computers or and. There was no such thing as DJs. People would have thought it was ridiculous that you would pay somebody to come someplace and play records. You don't right. pay for that. That's called a sock hop, and that's free. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, if there was a live band playing, and the drinking age was 21, which doesn't make any difference with the high school, but... Oh, no, I drank a lot more when I was underage. <laughs> but, 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 but my point being that back then, if there was a band playing someplace, you went. People went. This is my dear friend Oz Asborn. He's going to be on one week. We were talking. He grew up in a small town. And what he said, when a band came, everybody went yeah. because there was nothing else to do. Absolutely. And I saw one of the most lovely signs. That my work takes me on the road a lot in upstate New York. Going towards Cicero, there was a sign. There was a bowling alley. And it had the first part... <laughs> I don't make this up. It said, Friday night, gun raffle and sock hop at the bowling alley. <laughs> Absolutely. The the last gig that uh, Uptown Dog Food played was a, a New Year's Eve party at a place called Joker's in Auburn, which held about 2,000 people. And we made 1500 bucks. And we were uh, just a really crappy-ass high school band. Some people uh, want music to dance to though, you yep. figure. That's the See, it's part of it's the joy though, too. I think like my band Feedback, we called it that cuz our amps were like 15 bucks and we sucked. But, <laughs> but just I still think about when we played in high school and it's just the fun of being on stage and playing and see people sort of like not just throw pies in or something. <laughs> Have you ever played the venerable FNAs in Seneca Falls? Oh They're god, yes. Great, that's actually a great bar to play. I like that bar. But that was, what was your first bar gig that was that, and you said, like... Uh, that would also have been Uptown Dog yeah. Food. Uh, we played the uh, VFW Post in Auburn. We, play, we played maybe four or five high school dances around. Uh, I remember when we played Union Springs High School. It was Jordan Elbridge High School. That was our last gig. When we played Union Springs High School, I remember one of the chaperones, who was the music teacher at Union Springs, walked over to me and Steve McAvoy, the other guitar player in the band, visibly irate and walked up to us and very sternly said to us well young men it's fairly obvious to me that you play loud to cover up the fact that you can't play well and i remember steve looking at her and nodding his head going yeah <laughs> that's rock and roll dude <laughs> i think also you've had one of the best uh, the way you talk about covering songs compared to your originals, because I remember like one of my favorite covers of yours is from your band Static Cling, White Rabbit. I've always loved that, but you had the idea you can only write so many good songs a year. There's all these great songs out there. Well, I, I, I you know, in a lot of ways, I'm just an old fashioned hippie, and I really believe it's all just one big song. Um, it, you know, it's kind of a hippie idea. I don't. To me, it doesn't matter whether I wrote it or uh, Lennon McCartney wrote it or Jagger Richards or Bob Dylan. It's all one song. It's only twelve yeah. notes to work with. Right. What do you do with it? You know, and, and, and you know, this will sound arrogant, and I don't really care. But I will tell you that Infrared Radiations Orchestra's cover tunes are more original than a lot of bands. Oh, originals. I remember listening to. I have the shirt on from your cover album. A lot of them I listened to. This is the way they should have done them. That's not being arrogant. Oh, no, very, inventive, very inventive arrangements, yeah. I know. I was, like, well, I, 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 you together. know, I'm a huge Neil Young fan. No disrespect, man. Mm-hmm. But when we do Powderfinger, in the third verse, where it, uh, um, uh, I forget how it goes, but, but we do a stop there. And I, remember, and I remember when I came up with that idea to do that stop there, 
how did Neil Young not hear that you're supposed to do a stop there? <laughs> um, and you know, I, I, I just you know, it, to me, it's all just it's all just raw material to work with. Doesn't matter doesn't matter to me who wrote it. Um, you know, some of our, our we, I've never I've never been in a cover band because I've never done a straight cover. Yeah, I, I I have no interest in doing a straight cover. Now, some of those covers that I've done over the years, I've only changed them a little. And some I've changed a lot, but I've never done a straight cover. Um, I people have invited me to play with a band, sit in with a band, but they've been they you know I remember I was invited to sit in with a band in Ithaca that that doesn't um, they're a Paul Butterfield blues band tribute, and they they wanted me to play with them on um, East West the long improvisational thing, but they wanted me to learn Mike Bloomfield's guitar lines, and I'm like. And at first I had said yes to doing it because I thought we were going to improvise, but I'm not going to sit down and learn his guitar lines. No. I have no interest in doing that. Go home and listen to the record. Yeah, I've been using that with my friend Rob Mount where we talked about the difference between covering songs and being a tribute band. When you're a tribute band, people come out, they want to hear it note for note. They just want to have regurgitation of that band. When you're doing cover songs, you put your own spin on right. like you do. You just say, okay, I'm going to, like, I like your version of Sounds of Silence. <laughs> Which I won with the pumpkin drawing in one of your shows. Oh, cool. and I'm very proud about that. Cool. Okay, I gotta throw this in. So that's what you're here for. <laughs> I, recently, Susie Willpower has expressed interest in some of these old songs that I wrote. So they were written quite a few years ago. But you know, I don't do much writing in these other bands because I figure I'm like the George Harrison and all these bands, you know, with these great writers. But uh, so anyway. There's a couple songs, and they had I had a girl vocalist, so you know Frank the Blaze heard him once, and we were, I was showing him to him or something. He goes, "That would be great for Susie." So like about it took me about a year to finally say, "Hey, let's try these." Well, anyway, but one of the covers I want to do is a, a an arrangement of uh, "I Am a Rock." So it's another Simon and Garfungal that people don't really, but it's a, it's, a rock, it's a real an island a rock big no big pain. heavy groove yeah like you know but it's an alienation it's very punky really if you think about the lyrics it's alienation and uh you know not fitting in and all that kind of stuff so i came up with like an arrangement for that hopefully we can we'll do that sometime yeah and i know you played at the neil young shows almost every year yep and you always give it your own spin as i said and that's and those are fun. You played at them. You had to play at them. I've never you? done any of them. Because I know Susie's no. played there and everything else. Yeah, I, I do the George Harrison ones. And don't, and I mean, George Harrison was a really good writer, too. Don't knock yourself. Right, there. but I'm just saying. You should you have know. said, well, I was the Ringo yeah. star. <laughs> no, one of, one of my favorite covers that I've ever done is Static Kling used to do a cover of uh, Beware of Darkness. That was <laughs> great song. Yeah, what a great song that is, and, and a really fun cover to do. It's because I've been bored, and everybody's been bored during. <laughs> the whole pandemic i've been tossing out i usually don't do audience participation but i've been tossing out every down on questions on facebook and one of them i asked about what was your favorite solo beatles album i said all things must pass you know that's the thing so i think george yeah. is a really good songwriter uh, anybody can write you know two albums worth of stuff i mean three well you probably had them all blocked three. up because lennon and mccarty yeah. wouldn't record stuff <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I meant. You know, it's like, here's your one song. Go ahead, go for it. Yeah. That's what I said. We're like, we're old, but we've seen the great shows and the great bands. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that's the thing, and that's one of the questions I was thinking about. How okay, we have music 2020 from when you started and we were kids. How is what would you say like the major changes are in the whole business and whole band starting? And Produ I see your eyes go. Producers running the show instead of the musicians actually trying to come up with something yeah talking about this is just going to make me sound like an old fart but uh, it's okay that's what we're the, we're the, old what, what farts, the music we're the lonely farts club uh, band here don't what, worry what about the music industry has devolved See, into is just just beyond disgusting um sorry we have an emergency outcome. <laughs> one one thing i one thing one one you know when i get into this discussion a lot of times you know my wife and other people say oh you're just an old fart blah 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 you oh it was all better in the old days well one example i give back in the 60s capital records had the beatles and that was their cash cow they also had quicksilver messenger service quicksilver messenger service never made them any money at all it broke they broke even at best 
But Quicksilver Messenger Service's first album was the first rock and roll album that ever got a five-star review in Downbeat. And Downbeat always looked down their nose at rock and roll. They grudgingly started reviewing it in the 60s. But, you know, a five-star review for a rock band just didn't happen. And when Quicksilver got that five-star review, it meant something to Capitol. You know, they, they took out a big full-page ad in, in, in the trades announcing this because they were pro- because the music meant something to them. Today, unless it's selling, that means nothing. That's what them. I would say. In, uh, the only thing that matters to a record company now is sales. And the one thing, I read when I read Keith Richards' bio, and I thought it was very good, and he was talking, it almost seemed like people were looking. If you were an artist that time around there and you got heard, you would go on and you'd be playing your trip like the Beatles did in Hamburg and everybody would be playing and they would look the music would matter now okay does that person have the look and they sell you know do a couple crappy albums then we'll just toss them away just as long as you sell well and, and I, I've heard it said many times that um, in today's market Bob Dylan would have been dropped after his second album those first two albums didn't didn't sell enough for a major label to keep him on the roster he would have been dropped but back then there was a thing like called believing in your artist and giving them time to find an audience. It was still a business. You know, it was still probably a fairly crappy business, but at least there was some people in, in record labels who cared about music. <laughs> that is yeah, not... yeah, and the idea is, too, it's like your first album probably was not going to sell. And I'm actually thinking of Dylan's first album. I think that's the only time I've heard House of the Rising Sun sung from the female perspective because <laughs> I listen to that album an awful lot. But it seems like, okay, we understand you're going to have to grow as an artist. Now it's like sell one, next one half sales, next one you're gone, next one you're working at a convenience store, basically, and who the heck are you? There's no staying power. Yeah. And I don't think because there's not as much, because there's not the talent isn't there, the development isn't there. No, the artist development is, you know, that that's supposed to all be done in advance by management and producers, and you're supposed to deliver gold, and if you can't deliver gold... Hit the bricks. And honestly, who would have ever signed Captain Beefheart? Exactly. And I would ask you, like, even playing, because the Trope Mask replica, I just absolutely love. And I was told, people, either you're going to love it or you're not going to get it. I fell in love with his music. How, how difficult is that to play, though, if you've done covers? Oh, my God. Because I heard, like, the Magic Band did not want to reunite to do an Gen Walter because they didn't want to learn it all over again. Well, probably one of the simplest ones on there is The Blimp, which is a large part of the reason why that's a song we did. Um and we did a very simplified version of it, but but the music in general on that album is you know <laughs> is e- extremely advanced and and very very difficult and uh, a real gas to read about. Captain Beefheart's one of the my heroes that I actually got to meet and talk to for quite a while. I talked to him for over a half an hour on the streets of Boston in 1972. Um, which was an interesting conversation. Any good insights from him? Good well, old Don Van Blythe there. <laughs> well, it, it is interesting because I've heard what a what an incredible taskmaster he was. And But one thing I did read, and, and I also have a friend who had a lot of personal interaction with him, who actually booked a show and said he was a real jerk and real hard to work with. But one thing I have heard that members of the Magic Band have said was that um, Captain Beefheart and Don Van Vliet were two different people. And Don Van Vliet was a sweetheart of a guy, and Captain Beefheart was a tyrant. It was like that Jekyll and Hyde. Right, and my friend, I think, from what he tells me, he was dealing with Captain Beefheart. (laughs) I met Don Van Vliet, and Don Van Vliet was a really nice guy and talked my ear off. As a matter of fact, he was late for a radio interview because he was talking to me, and he was the one who kept talking. And his wife and Zuthorn Rollo, Bill Harkle Road, were with him. And they're like, come on down, we got to go, we got to go, we're going to be late for the interview. And I remember Beefheart saying, talking to a fan, he's way more important than any interview. <laughs> I had that with Dick Dale. I went before his show, I went to meet him at the House of Guitars. He was two hours late. Comes in, we start talking. I asked him about surf guitar, and he said, well... You know, I played left-handed, and a lot of people thought I started this with Link Ray. If people are looking at me behind me. Like, I'm gonna, we're going to jump this guy when he goes out, because we're talking, like, for 20 minutes. By the time we were over, he was inviting me to his house in Big Sur. <laughs> Gene Clark from the Birds invited me to stop at his house. Uh, I opened for him at the Rangovian Embassy and had dinner with him, and he was super nice, too, and he, uh, he invited me to stop. He gave me his home address and phone number and told me to get in touch with him if I was ever in L.A., and I think it was 
less than two years after that that he died. But I, I still carry his phone number with me. It's always cool. It's always cool having. I was actually talking to a friend of mine about this of some interaction with musicians. It's just good to see them on a human level, even and through the years and everything. And I remember one story though in terms of difficult musicians. My friend Greg Townsend. He said he was recording next to Van Morrison, and he could hear him. Throwing musicians out, right and left, if they got the wrong, like the wrong note. Yeah, Van Van's known for being a little bit um, prickly. <laughs> um, what, what's what's the policy on these podcasts as far as uh, you can swear all you want? Yeah, I can swear all I want. Yeah, we're rated for that's why everybody enjoys it. Like radio people love it because they could say fuck. <laughs> well, I uh, I have a I have a Van Morrison bootleg, the title of which is. Uh, um, go fuck yourself, and I thought, <laughs> okay then. I, oh, I, 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 I hope, I hope he says that at some point in this bootleg. I hope it's an interaction between him and the audience, and it is. Somebody, somebody's calling out for, uh, for one of the hits, and Van saying, uh, "Our drummer was kidnapped. He's back. Drum roll, please." And Van, 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 Van saying, "I'm going to play what I want. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to play what I want to play. If you don't like it, go fuck yourself." <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's it's why. It's like I'm, this one. I have this one, Rocky Erickson. It has to be a bootleg. It's called don't knock the rock he's just it's like one of those things like being like musicians do where they just all of a sudden in the studio start jamming probably shouldn't have been released he's just doing old songs you can just hear him because rocky's one of my <laughs> idols me too but the 16 i mean the 13th for elevators and rocky and then when i saw you're gonna miss me when i'm gone the documentary made me very sad but i'm glad he's getting some appreciation do you have his last album yeah yeah, and the, the liner notes to that are just just amazing, and the fact that he reconnected with the mother of his son and ended up marrying her after they'd been apart for what forty years or something yeah. like that. Wow. Well, I was watching like Sven Gulli was on. They had Creature from the Adam Brain, and they said a movie good enough. Rocky wrote a song about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other one that I've always really liked and I've always appreciated that you've liked him, and you've written a song about him, you've covered Sex Beat as Jeffrey Lee Pierce. Oh. And I try to get the word out, you must like him, I hope. Who? Oh, drummers. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Lee. Gun Club, Jeffrey Lee Pierce. Never heard of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you know. I'm not a big fringe music person, I have He's to be not, I would call you. it, I don't know what, what you'd call it, Swamp Rock, just, I just I've always, the problem with well, Jeffrey I, I, Lee. I think, I think, uh, you know, it's really, really limiting to say this, but I think especially the early stuff is kind of blues punk, and he, they were really... Well, I had, I tried, I have friends, and I grew up in my generation, was I'll that time with the, <laughs> the hair bands, the metal of the 80s, so I tried to give, I used to be called all kinds of horrifying names in high school because <laughs> of my music taste, and I would try to make, I would make them you know, tapes of Gun Club, and I would just get the response, this music sucks, and all I would say was... Either you get the voice or you don't. Maybe the voice turns some people off. I like his voice. To me, and this is kind of a lofty comparison, but to me, it, 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 it hits me kind of the same way Billie Holiday's voice does. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's got that certain flatness. But, Whale, though, too. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and I, just, I just love his songwriting. And, you know, that, that, that album kind of reminds me of the old times, too, because that's when everything, that was, it was I bought that first album, it was pre-CDs, and I remember when albums were 12 by 12 inches, and a lot of times you could take a chance on just how cool an album cover looked. <laughs> that, Those right. days are gone. Oh, yeah. That yeah was, I would sure. go down, yeah. literally go anywhere like Lakeshore Record Exchange, House of Guitars, and use my Paperboy money. And if the album looked cool, I would buy it. I think the first one I ever bought was Atomic Rooster because I liked the cover. That was a cool cover. Well, I walked into a record store in Chicago, and I saw three albums. I didn't know anything about any of them. Uh, well, I, I, I knew something about one of them. But uh, I bay, well, two of them I bought strictly on the cover, and one was the first Gun Club album, and the other one was an album uh, called La Rocca by Snips, who was Steve Parsons, who was the lead singer in Sharks. Uh, but anyway, two of my all-time favorite albums, and the third album I bought that day was, was the SVT album, which was the uh, three-piece punk band from San Francisco that Jack Cassidy from Jefferson Airplane was the bass player in. Because Jack was one of the few people from the 60s who didn't run screaming out the door when punk came along. Yeah. Instead, he went and joined a punk band. I've always enjoyed the idea. I tell people of music. I use the 
the quote from Duke Ellington, there's either good music or bad music. And what I like is your horizons expand and expand. I call some albums gateway drugs. You just like this music. Then you pick some other genre. Wow, I like that. You go on to something else. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I love. If you have an open mind, if you don't just get stuck in, well, I have to listen to Top 40, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah. The, the, people have often asked me, you know, well, ever since I been was 10 years old, all I've ever wanted with my disposable cash is records. That's it. You know, when, when I was a kid, my parents, all all they would get for me for, for Christmas is I'd give them a list of a thousand albums I wanted. And, and they'd say, why'd you give us a list of a thousand albums? We're not going to buy, it was always a thousand. I said, because I want to be surprised. Well, so I, I did a list of a thousand albums. I have no idea which I, ones I used to come say, like my buddies and I, we would go to Lakeshore Record Exchange. We'd be the guys, we'd come in, Ron Stein was the owner, we'd come in on Saturday, what do you got, what do you got for us? And we'd be the guys, we'd have a stack like this, it would be Hank Williams on top, Blue Easter Cult in the middle, and Slayer on the bottom. Mm. That would be us. We would just grab everything. I saw the zombies, like the cover. Buy it, you know, where people would just get pigeonholed into whatever they're supposed to listen to, right? You know, and sometimes it'd be the bias. Sometimes if it's popular, I just step back. But you know, some popular stuff's good. I think my first one was the Vanilla Fudge, the first Vanilla Fudge album, and I got hooked on that stuff. I really liked all that, the psychedelia. Did you ever listen there. to his Cactus? Oh yeah, got, Cactus got all those too. Yeah. yeah, I've read his book. The man is a sex maniac basically <laughs> but he has a quote about you know back in the day we'd see guys and we would compare you know the women we got the drugs we took now all we do is go around asking each other what kind of high blood pressure medicine we're on <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> but it was a piece and it was it was apathy then it was a piece because they did the name though right but he's been all around cactus was a great band oh yeah there was a guy from rochester i played i guess on the live album that warner fritchings guy He's from this area. That but actually, story. the one good story you told me, if you remember, I guess from you I learned, I guess Bowie didn't like Morrison. Oh, yeah. You have to yeah, tell, yeah. I just was laughing about this. About this well, this is Steve McAvoy, who was the leader of my first band, Uptown Dog Food. And um, we saw Bowie here on the Diamond Dogs tour. It was the next tour. That he when got he got, a, oh, okay, no, he didn't no, get no, pinched It was the next yet. year he got arrested. The Diamond, But uh, we saw him at the Diamond Dogs tour, and afterwards... Steve McAvoy and ended up well, well. We ended up in the um, hotel bar where Bowie was after the show, and you know he had a, he had his entourage with him and a bunch of people kind of looking and pointing and and you know, so but McAvoy went up to him and McAvoy's a Doors fanatic, <laughs> and he said to Bowie, um, he goes, "Oh, great concert! We're big fans." He goes, uh, "I hear a lot of uh, Doors influence in your music." And Bowie said, I loathe the doors. <laughs> and McAvoy said, oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I had my own. I, I, Tom Cohen had Neil Innes play. So I had my Bonzo Doodah Dog band things. He played Sir Robin, so I went up to him, and I said something about Eric Idle. I didn't realize they must be having a lawsuit or something. Oh, geez. Because I got, the, I got the look of death. Mm. <laughs> and you said, I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, my, my friend had a similar experience, so... Uh, I, I, they have since uh, buried the hatchet and are friendly again, but uh, he saw Martin Barr perform in a store in uh, Portland, Oregon, and went up and asked him about Mick Abrams. And I, guess, <laughs> I guess Martin Barr went off on There was this oh, one boy. thing I saw on PBS about Jethro Tull over the years and all the members, so you wonder... <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess for there was very bad blood between Barr and Abrams for many years, but all, evidently they're friends now. The only thing I would look at is, I mean, I, would, I suppose I would look at is, how would the person know? That's the only thing. But still, it's like, oops. <laughs> well, I mean, it's kind of a weird question, though. I mean, well, what do you think of your predecessor? And what, you know, I mean, I guess if you're asking a specific, have you did were you building on what he started or something like that? But to just like. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what the guy asked. Or the classic was. frenemies, uh, Dave Edmonds and Nick Lowe. When I saw them right. here, it was low play. This was at the Bombay Bicycle Club the first time. And Edmonds, I don't remember if the weather was terrible or not, nobody was there. So then when Lowe played, it was packed. And now I don't know if it, I can't remember years ago if it was the weather or what, because when he played at Montage with Marshall Crenshaw, it was sold out for two shows. But anyways, I'm talking to Lowe, and he, I said, I saw Edmonds here, and he looks at me, he was really, con how did he draw? And he got a big smile on his face. When he <laughs> 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 but I know you've, you've known some members of Blue Easter Cult, haven't you? Yeah, I, I, well, that, that came from being in a band with Helen Wheels. 
and she was part of the Blue Oyster Cult camp. I, I tell the story, and I will explain it. I know the guys from Blue Oyster Cult because they're short. That's the reason I know them. <laughs> And I'll explain that. <laughs> Everybody in Blue Oyster Cult, the original lineup, is real short. Uh, Alan Lanier was like 5'5", five, five, and he towered over the rest of the band. Um, uh, Buck but, Dharma is five foot tall. Um, Donald Rozier, is he in there the first Yeah, band? Don Rozier's like 5'3". Um, Damn. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Joe Bouchard's like 5'2", and Albert Bouchard's like 5'1". So they're all really, really short guys. So they were, they were, Albert was uh, at Stony Brook College, and he was a sophomore. And Helen Wheels was a freshman, and Helen Wheels is 4'11". And um, I ended up in a band with her. But back when they were in college, one of Albert's friends came to him and said, oh, my God, Albert, there's this really hot new freshman, and she's even shorter than you. And Albert's like, I got to meet her. And they ended, up, they ended up being a couple for quite a while. And then after they weren't a couple anymore, they were still friends. And she lived in the communal BOC house. She sold their uh, black leather clothes. She was a seamstress. And she was a poet, and she wrote a lot of their lyrics. She wrote lyrics for six songs. And if you see on any Blue Oyster Cult, some of them are credited to H. Wheels, and some of them are credited to her real name, H. Robbins. And she wrote the lyrics for Tattoo Vampire, which was the B-side of Don't Fear the Reaper. And writing the lyrics for that made her more money than her entire musical career combined. But anyway, she had a band that was kind of at the top of the bubble of the CBGBs, Max's bands that didn't get signed. She was right on that edge and probably would have been signed, except she had a big showcase show for Columbia Records. And the night before the performance, her guitar player and her drummer found out that she was sleeping with both of them. Oh boy. And they had a big blow up and they both quit. So she had to play with pickup musicians for this big showcase gig. And so that that fell through, and, and uh, but then many years, and then she retired from music. She was a regular on the CBGB's Max's scene, and then uh, she retired. I I met her through a weird set of circumstances, and talked her out of retirement, and put a band together with her. She ended up the girlfriend of Will, who used to have. Monty, I know this is where I my yeah, connection. Who with used her to is. have Monty's Crown? Because I used to work in Monty's Crown. And. Um, she died very young. She died at 50 um, after we'd been together for two, two and a half years. Um, <clears throat> but it was through her that I got to know all the Blue Oyster Cult people because she remained friends with all of them. And um, it was through her that, you know, I, we got to play at CBGB's. And, and it was, you know, and as a result of my friendship with the Blue Oyster Cult guys, they've, they've come out and sat in with, with my band when we played in New York City. And uh, so I, I, I'm... I know Buck a little bit. I've I've know Buck enough to say hello to him, and and I but I know Joe and Al Bouchard fairly well. I have my Helen with Love album because I remember I heard the whole story about what happened to her those days. Those were when I was at the Crown. But the one thing I was gonna because there was a story the G Man told us. He said the whole more cowbell thing originated from Bloister Cult. And I wonder if you've ever heard that before. You know, when people yell more cowbell, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it, where it came it's from. from okay. a, yeah, it's, it's from a Saturday Night Live skit where they're recording "Don't Fear the Reaper," which has the cowbell. <laughs> and Albert has kind of a funny story. It's not real funny, but because it's from the actual guy, it's kind of interesting. Albert tells that um, he's the guy playing cowbell on that song, <laughs> okay. and he said, and ba back then, if I wasn't on the road, he said I watched Saturday Night Live every Saturday night. And he said, and one night, I'm laying on the couch, watching TV, waiting for Saturday Night Live to come on, and I fell asleep. And he goes, and then an hour later, my phone's ringing. And I pick up the phone, they're like, Albert, are you watching SNL? And he's like, oh, I fell asleep, why? And they go, there's a skit on there about you. <laughs> and he said, and I, and I turned to the TV just as the skit was ending. He said, well, of course, I've seen it dozens of times since then, but he slept through it the first I time. I love the validation, because I got to know Ian McLogg in a bit when he came to town. So I asked him, I read Rod Stewart's book, and they said the Faces were the first band to be thrown out of the Holiday Inn, and the way they got around it was they registered at Fleetwood Mac, and then they caught him. So I told Ian McLogg, and then he looked at me, and he said, Rod's got that wrong. We got thrown out of the holiday and he said, well, it was my fault. I felt like throwing a bunch of stuff out the window. It seemed like a thing to do. But he said what we did was we registered first as family because they were on our own. Then they chucked them out. 
So we registered, I think it was at the Grateful Dead. Then they, they caught on to us. They love me now. But I loved Ian. But just the idea of <laughs> interacting with him. He was such a sweet fellow. Yeah. And everything. But what do, they, what do you do when they yell more cowbell at you? I hit a cowbell usually. <laughs> Have you ever hit a cowbell tunnel? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I tried them a couple times with like on a if like a duo or something. If the guy already has one, I don't have one, but I, uh, they're kind of cool. For a long time in, in Static Cling, I had a drummer who was all the time building weird stuff, <laughs> and he <laughs> built a cowbell pedal at one it's point. It's a good idea. He mounted a cowbell <laughs> and hooked a pedal up to it. He also built a drum kit once that was um, a kick drum, and then he had this big long steel stand that had cymbals and, and toms on it so wow. it was just like this one big stand then he also built himself a, a kick drum that was twice as deep as a normal <laughs> kick drum and those are big now every mm -hmm. time well not like this one this yeah. one was about as as long as that about as deep as that <laughs> oh, <wow>. <laughs> and i remember we played a gig like that and every time he hit that kick drum it was deafening for yeah, me it was back. <laughs> and, and afterwards he said to us he goes Jeez, I think that new kick drum sounded pretty good. I'm I think you nailed it. I'm like, no, you're I not. think I got nailed with that at one gig. I was like standing to the right of the stage. Oh my god! And blasted like echoed through was my ears. So freaking loud. <laughs> but you were mentioning my, about my, fa my favorite thing he built though was he took an old ventriloquist dummy uh. and hooked a uh, a uh, motor from a mixer up inside of it so that he could step on a pedal and this this ventriloquist <laughs> dummy by the side of the oh, stage that's great. Just start, start dancing around. That's the theatrical aspect of it. I love it. But the other thing, I would be like you for Christmas. I'd ask for, the only difference would I would also ask for comic books. And that was my big thing. And you... I, I really love this. Kim's written a comic book called The Girls and the Star Death and Consortium. It's actually a story that takes us back to 1977 Halloween with a certain punk band playing with Armin Schauerberg. The House of Guitars are in this. And is this based on reality? Oh, that is 100% true. It is true? There's, there's that is, I can picture the suit. It's a, I have to read the back for you. A Tale of Mad Genius. Rock and Roll Mayhem and Chicken Feathers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you want to see the dude wears, he cuts his arms up the singer Gary. Yep. He cuts it up, wears fishnet stockings, silver boots, and chicken feathers. And they play a gig, the House of Guitars, Armin, they're going to have a Halloween concert. And they kick them off, and I don't want to spoil it, but Armin says, that was the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. I'm going to play now. <laughs> yeah, that, this in my 50 years of good stories, rock and roll stories I have, this is the but best that story. That is you, right? This is the best story. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, I mean, I think that's why I've kept a journal since like 1985. Because you write them down, you have some good tales to tell. You got to get them out there and entertain people, and it's fun. Well, this this is uh, this is this is my best story of all, and this is the comic book that is for sale for five bucks. Which I've got it the first night it was released, of course. Pluck me, pluck and can me. like we we do plugs at the end of the show, but can people still pick this up? Oh, somewhere? absolutely, absolutely. I'll tell you, they've got a bunch of them at the House of Guitars. <laughs> or, or you can buy them from me at Infrared Gigs if Infrared Gigs ever happen again. Yeah, that's what we'll get into next. But the thing, too, is I actually got very nostalgic for House of Guitars TV as if you're reading this. I remember, the, like, the Professor Erwin Corey take, well, there's a little room where you can go back and relieve yourself. Mm. And I would go down. I used to live in Irondequite. And I would go walk down there, and Armour's wife was always saying, he should clean it up a little. I'd be going through, oh, there's a Seeds album. There's this album, you know, trying to dig through. <laughs> well, you, you've seen the the girls' commercial, right? Yeah. Okay. But I love those. I haven't seen, but I just love the old commercials and hop hop and everything. Right. Well, very inventive when they started that. I mean, that it, was the place. Was that was like that. people would like to go amusement parks. My friends and I, when my dad would drive us down the house of guitars, that was our carnival. Just going to look for cool stuff and dig through. And I always liked the idea, you know, now on the internet you can go look up, get whatever of the find. You would find this really cool album or something, and it was just great. It was like a little carnival fun. And of course, my brother's band, that's the thing my brother said about Jeffrey Lee Pierce. When he met him, he was very quiet, shy, wanted to lose weight. And I, there was like a new Math Gardens thing by the bathroom, and I thought that was perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you who else was very, very shy and reserved and uh, quiet when I met him was uh, Lux. Oh, that's I was going to mention him. That I know, I think didn't Lux and Ivy own a record store, maybe. But there's a story about them that I've heard where New Math played with them at Scourge's, and I guess what happened, they went out to Marge's afterwards. And Ivy wore a big leopard skin. There was some drunk there looked at her and said, Va, 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 voom! <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I ran into them at the Bop Shop 
uh, in the afternoon of when they were playing here in Rochester, and uh, Ivy was dressed in her stage clothes, you know, in the uh, in the old um, um, uh, Village Gate. Village Gate. Village Gate. You know, she's walking around the different shops, all dressed in her, her Arabian Nights pantaloons and, and all that <laughs> stuff. And and Lux was in a pair of jeans and a white button Not his down heels shirt, and, and show. his and his uh, um, horn rim glasses. And very, and just asking Tom, uh, you know, about all these old obscure Ford, Rockabilly Ford, well, do you have this one? Or do you have this? And just very, very quiet, very reserved. People don't get, it's like you said about Captain Beefheart, it's a performance for a lot of people. It's not the same person on stage as off. Right. You know? Not like you, when you're on stage, you're like a wild man throwing sticks at everybody, and then you're, <laughs> you're fairly mellow <laughs> off stage, you know? <laughs> yeah, well. Well, for me... <laughs> I've always felt like for a lot of musicians, you know, they live their everyday life and then they get to cut loose and be somebody else when they get on stage. For me, it's just the opposite. That's the only time I feel like me. Yeah, you yeah. Know, for the, me, the, I get the day to day life, the going to work, the collecting a paycheck, yeah. the paying the bills. That's all pretended. That's, that's all. That's like me I say, I do. I use my my normal job to fund my other interests. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, I still like, like setting up drums. I mean, yeah. when I get sick of that and putting them in the car, that's probably when I'll quit doing it. Yeah. The biggest <laughs> thing I found drag queens, because mm-hmm. I'm very much into that community, and I could tell the story about hanging out one time at Edibles, going through the whole martini menu, talking with drag queens about the difference between cat and dogs. Uh, but they're gonna, very shy, you know, very in I, person. I, I, I was in a band in Chicago. We were the house band at a drag queen bar for... But did you find them very offstage, different people? Oh yeah, yeah well, very, very shy. Well, very like the, I was. I was living in Chicago, and actually, we lived in the suburbs, and we had a band, and that Static Cling one. That's not the same Static Cling I had here, and we played a few shows and it went pretty well. And I thought, okay, we're ready to play downtown. So I went driving downtown, and I found this club, Jamie's Elsewhere, and I saw the list of the bands that were um, headlining there. And they were like not the top tier punk and new wave bands. They were the second tier, good bands, but not the top tier. I thought, well, this is a place maybe we could get into. Maybe we could headline here. So I went in and gave him my sales pitch. And uh, <laughs> the one manager owner was uh, literally called Fast Eddie. He mm-hmm. literally had a pencil thin mustache, and uh, he kind of bought what I was selling. And he gave us a couple of bookings, and he said, now. He goes, now, do you know about Jamie's Elsewhere? And I could tell by the way he asked it that there's a story here. And I'm not from Chicago. I'd only been there less than a year probably at this point. And I said, well, he goes, well, do you know the history of this place? And I said, no. And he goes, well, we just bought it, and we're going to turn it into a punk rock bar. He goes, but for the past 20 years, it's been one of the main drag queen bars in town. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, okay. And he goes, we're not kicking the drag queens out. We figure we're just, you know, they, they like disco music, so we're just going to start booking punk bands, and we figure eventually the drag queens will leave, and the punks will start coming. <laughs> so your first few gigs here are probably going to be mostly for drag queens. And I'm like, okay. Mm-hmm. So we get in there to play our first <laughs> show, and the band consists of me, another guitar player, a singer, and a drummer who are all in our mid to late 20s. And have been around to some degree. And a 17-year-old bass player from the suburbs who's almost never in his... The only time he's ever been to downtown Chicago is once a year Christmas shopping with his mom. (laughs) He lives in the suburbs, and that's... He's he's a suburban kid. So we're in there playing. And if you've been into a a drag queen bar in a good-sized city, you know that some of them are freaking gorgeous. Yeah. (laughs) And some of them aren't. Some some of them look like lumberjacks (laughs) and chiffon. Some of them are freaking gorgeous. And he had no clue. So we're playing, and we take our first break, and we're sitting at the bar, and this one drag queen is like, and, and she's hot. She's all over him. She's kissing him and rubbing his leg and buying him drinks, and he's in heaven, and he has no clue it's a guy. And he comes over to me and Ed, the drummer, and he's like, oh, my God, 
This is so great. I can't believe it. Our first gig downtown, and I'm going to get lucky. I'm going to get laid. And Ed, the drummer's like, yeah, Randy, you go for it. You go for it. <laughs> he goes back over. They do some more kissing, some more rubbing of legs and, and, and all that stuff. He comes back over to us. He goes, oh, my God, we got to play down, downtown all the time. This is so great. I can't believe I'm going to get laid. Mm-hmm. And Ed's like, yeah, Randy, you go for it. You go for it. So then it's time for the break to be over and for us to go back on stage. And I say, well, time to go back on stage, Randy. And um, he steps away from the bar and said, by the way, Randy, you know, your girlfriend there, you know that's a man, right? He was, had her in a club in old Soho. Yeah. He, he, he said, what, what do you mean it's a man? I said, it, it's a man, Randy. He goes, no, it's not. She's hot. And I said, Randy, have you noticed that we've got a really good crowd here tonight and the only men in here is us <laughs> and he looks around and he sees there's nothing but women in the place and he goes oh my god you're right it's all chicks here and i go randy that's because they're all men and he's like what are you talking about what are you talking about <laughs> and then i started pointing out some of the ones that had like a five o'clock shadow or uh, <laughs> or hair on their knuckles and i'm like and i said even the hot ones and he goes but she's got tits i go yeah some of them got implants some of them are taking hormone shots really randy and He's like all dejected and kind of mopes his way back to the stage. And Ed, the drummer, goes, why'd you tell him? He would have gone home with that guy. He wouldn't have found out until they got in bed. It would have been great. It would have been fabulous. But that's why people can't figure me out, because especially in America 2020, we're so divided. I say you have to every, accept everything. Just That's how you experience life and have fun. Where do you get the good stories like yeah. that? But now we have to go to the creation, and of course, it's very, very, I recommend if we ever have live shows again, we ever get out of here, uh, Infrared Radiation Orchestra. And I've been on the bottom floor with this. I mean, the Theramone, number one. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. But they're, you're a mix. I can't describe, again, every album is different, and there's so many different types of music in this. I love it. Well, you, you know, uh, Jim Catalano, uh, who's the uh, arts and entertainment editor for the Ithaca paper, um, what he said about us that I thought was really, really nice. And uh, he said, if you see Infrared Radiation Orchestra, you're going to hear everything good that happened in rock and roll from 1966 to 1976. And, you know, I, 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 it is all in there. I mean, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's a real... It's a real melt, you know. The sound is a real melting pot of 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 everything. But I think I think it really retains its own personality, even though you hear bits and pieces. You of do so your much. own. It's it's that's the best way to describe it. I have certain bands I'll recommend to people, and they'll say, "What are they like?" And I go, "I can't describe them, but they're just damn good." And you're one of those bands because I can't really say, you know, oh, well, do you like this? Some people like, okay, you like jazz, is this? But you're going to get a little bit of everything. And I still remember Stan Merrill going up at that one gig at Love and Cup in 2020. I don't even want to say it, but he had a tinfoil hat on. He's playing the theremin because <laughs> we were going to equate tinfoil hats with, well, these days, <laughs> you know, make America cheese again. <laughs> you know, I've, I, I've, I started using a theremin in, in my first band in Uptown Dog Food because um, I had a friend who was really into electronics and he had one of the little kit theremins that he gave to me. And we used to end our set with heroin by the Velvet Underground. And um, I uh, had a Sun 60 amplifier. And at the end of heroin, I just had the guitar and the theremin plugged into the same amplifier. I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. And had everything cranked and just the screaming feedback from the guitar and the theremin going. And at our very last show, it all caught on fire, <laughs> and, it, and it had a plastic case, and it, you melt, playing fire it in me- the cockpit, melted my theremin to the top of the amplifier. <laughs> and I remember the police coming through the door just as uh, my amp burst into flames, and that was that was at the end of Uptown Dog Food's last gig. So, That's the way to go out, though, is <laughs> Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Greg, go on. Well, if I may tell you about, uh, did you? Have, well, I was going to, go ahead. I yeah, we because I have a little story to tell after. Yeah, go on. Then we'll get to. Well, my, my favorite story. I, I told you that Uptown Dog Food's first paying gig was that German club dance. But the first time we played in front of people, I went over to Steve McAvoy's house. He was the leader of the band, and we were rehearsing in his basement. And it was my first band, and uh, Steve had to kind of talk me into joining the band. I, I was I was going to be one of those people who wasn't coming out of my bedroom with my guitar till I thought I was ready. 
And McAvoy basically said to me, there ain't no such thing as ready. You just got to do it. And so he talked me into it. I went to my first band practice. We've been practicing for about a half an hour. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is so great. I'm so glad he talked me into this. And then his father calls from upstairs. And Steve, had his, his bedroom was in the basement. And he said, Stephen, there's a phone call for you. So Steve takes the call in his room. And I only hear Steve's side of the conversation. And I hear him saying, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. uh-huh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, thanks. He hangs up the phone, he turns to the rest of us, he goes, we got a gig. And I'm like, great, when? He goes, right now. <laughs> He's like, Steve, we've only been a band for 30 minutes and we only know two songs. He goes, well, stretch them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to do it. A little long jam. Those were the days too. Was so, a long jam. So we so. went across town to this. The parents are away for the weekend. <laughs> high school backyard beer party, <laughs> and we set up under the swing set. We hung our PA speakers off the swing set, which were two big giant horns. We didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> and we did Sweet Jane for forty-five minutes, and we were about. About done with our 45-minute version of Who Do You Love when the cops turned off the electricity to the house. <laughs> yes. Perfect. We had lived in the depth, but Greg, what were you going to say? Well, I was going back to the when we were talking about musicians being <clears throat> one way on stage, one way off. When I was in a show band, I got pretty lucky back then. It was, it was the early 80s, but <clears throat> I got into this show band and played around Florida and all that stuff, and then they had a thing in Europe, so... I got. I went to Europe for three months, and but and it was all cover stuff. But but we had a floor show, and it, it was a different kind of band. So anyway, we were in Atlantic City when we came back, and we were playing in the bar. And at one time in Resorts International, so in the big hall they'd have. I saw, I saw Paul Anka, and I saw a bunch of big acts. <clears throat> but one time Gary Puckett was playing. And he had his new band when he had a couple of his brothers, and this is you know after the Union Gap and everything else. So the guitar player started hanging around, and we just got to be buddies a little bit, road buddies, you know. He goes, "Hey, you want to meet the mamas and the papas?" I said, "Oh, sure." So he takes me to another hotel, and I meet them, and I go party in their room, and I get to see the show and all that. But then eventually, for some reason, I found out that the Romantics were playing in New Jersey at some place called Sandy's, I believe was the name of the bar. And so I talked to Gary and a couple of his guys. Hey, you, just, you guys want to go hear this band? We're going to go hear the Romantics. Okay, so we all jump in my station wagon and we go. I mean, there was no, hey, can you help me out? Hey, I got these songs. Hey, I'm, none of that. It was just, let's go drink some beers and go hear a band. And hey, thanks a lot. That was fun. See you later. Bye. You know, but, uh, you know, you, you, I'm sure a lot of these people, like, oh, man, you know, I, they, 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 you kiss their ass. You want to get a deal or you want a favor or you want free tickets and Sometimes it's just nice, hey man, just be friends with him. The only one was my dear friend Hayden, God rest his soul, he passed away a couple years ago. He loved Duran Duran, so I had to go see them at a, at a casino. I casino. <laughs> and he went up there, he spent the money, we had suites on top. We passed and was like, that's Nick Rhodes, isn't it? We ended up getting them partying with us because we had all the booze we smuggled and they didn't have any. <laughs> what they tried to do was work us up with women. We're like, yeah, they're with us, they're with us. <laughs> Which is just one of those funny stories, because you know you walk by somebody... <laughs> and it was just like for him he said it was the greatest night of his life and I remember one of my friends was a bartender came up with these banana schnapps killer drinks so I'm surprised they didn't write a song about him but so far you've done five infrared radiation album market then you've done one's cover and if you want to hear how cover songs can be done if we've talked about get this one we'll get them all how many are available have any of them sold out well um we actually uh, have uh found a manufacturer for these discs so we do them we do an initial run of 400 and we usually sell that out within a couple of years but this place here you can do reorders really small quantities and still get them pretty cheap so we uh we try to keep uh 20 to 30 of them in stock at all times the original runs have run out of all of them uh but uh you know we always we always keep them all in print we were about halfway through the recording of our That's new That's what album. I had to ask you about in terms of everything's gone to basically shit this year for yeah. obvious reasons. And it's a new world and for musicians, obviously. That's one of the reasons I want to keep doing the podcast is to try to... Do not say we are all in this together. If I hear that one more time, I'm going to punch somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I feel we're all in this separately. There we there go. You Thank go. you. Now, that's a much better way to look at it. 
I feel it's every I hate man empty for himself slogans. and screw I do. everybody else. You know, well, I, do, and, I do hate empty slogans, and, and though. It's like, do something. Don't just, we're in this together. Wham, wham. That, that's what I, you know. Don't me some money, then, if we're in it together. <laughs> every public relations firm jumped on this. And it's like, all of a sudden, all these commercials are perfectly, you know, written for the, the whole situation. And you start thinking, okay, so if they can get behind this quickly... Why can't they get behind another message, a better yeah. message? Yeah, that always. And I actually want to do one thing. One of my projects is I want to I want to do a almost a journal of various friends' reactions to this because I have some friends. One of my friends is a very big introvert, and she said, "This is I've never been happier." And you have people who are miserable, and you just I mean, obviously, I can be a loner. You know, I love my friends, the people in my life, but I don't mind being alone. It takes my creativity. But some people, are, loneliness is a big thing for some people. You can't really do anything about it. Like one of my friends, his dad has pancreatic cancer, and he's going to pass, we know he's going to pass away, and unfortunately. But he said, how is he going to say goodbye to his grandkids and everything when he can't even see them? So there's right. a lot of human stories in this. But anyways, we're going to, in terms of music, people, you got to think, this is one industry, obviously, people can't do their livelihoods because they can't play out and everything else. You know, so it's one of those things I really try to focus on. But in terms of to go get with the somber bit there, in terms of your new album, how's it going? Well, we were about halfway, a little less than halfway, probably about forty percent of the way through recording it when when the, the plague hit. Um, I am going to start doing some overdubs next week at my bass player's house, um, and the plans are this is going to be a real, real special project. We're going to do a double disc. Uh, a new CD of all originals and a new CD of all covers with guests. And um, uh, we've got some big names for the guests. I don't really want to mention the names no. because I, I, I don't... The one name I will mention who is firmly committed is uh, June Millington from Fanny is going to play slide guitar on one song. Um, and then there's a few other big names that I don't want to mention until it actually comes to pass because I'd hate to put it out there and they're only about a 90% commitment at this point in time. Yeah. So if and it doesn't, it's 2020. So. And, and so if it doesn't happen, I don't want people saying, yeah, I, yeah do you hear them saying that? that do you <laughs> so, and, and so there's a couple other names that we think are going to be on it. Um, so, you know, I'm pretty excited about that. I'm, you know, I'm pretty bummed that it, it's been put on hold for so long. And hopefully we're going to be able to I time I think one it. of your shows was one of the first ones that got canned during this that I had on my calendar. Oh, I think yeah. because it was like, we did a, the last podcast we did in March, we had Anonymous Pits Willpower's new CD release. That didn't happen. All, All right. these others. And it sort of went under from there. But I think your show was on my calendar and then it wasn't on the calendar anymore. Yeah, we, we, we were, it was going to be the uh, celebration of my 50th year in showbiz. And, uh, yeah. but hopefully we're, hopefully the, the reschedule of that show will coincide with the release of the new vaccine. And so I have to do a double celebration. And I have right. to do also your selling point because you do it all the time. And I think you do it beautifully. There's a deal. The CDs are $10 a piece. So one for 10. Two for twenty, three for thirty, four for forty, or four for fifty. <laughs> Deal in any price. That's right. But yeah, and we always do a special order in advance deal, and you get something special, like whether it's a T-shirt or or the lyrics or, or something. I have this bonus CD right here, and I also have a pin. Do, do, do you have the uh, the uh, bonus CD from the last one? It's the one with the sounds of silence and everything. Oh, okay. Was that your release? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I um, picked out of the pumpkin out of the right. hat. I get. I didn't get. You had some great giveaways so i could tell you <laughs> well what we're what we're planning to do for this next one is and for the special deals usually you pay a little bit extra but you get a t-shirt or you get this or you get that you get a signed edition of the album for the next one we're actually going to if people order it and pay for it in advance they're going to get both discs for 15 instead of 20 plus there's going to be some original art that we're going to put out with it and um and a lyric sheet and uh 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 essays on each of the songs i like i actually that's become one of my favorite things too is just hearing the stories behind and something i like how you do that in terms of like with the cover album you wrote like what this meant that was awesome but i think finally either of you two you could steal this ideal if you ever do a live album after 2020 you <clears> just <throat> have to call infrared radiation orchestra any of your multiple bands live finally oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know, this has been very fun. I hope you've had a good time. Being I'm out here. of the house. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hope you've enjoyed absolutely. yourself coming great. down. And good to see you. I mean, don't feel that special. It's good to see anybody this year. <laughs> and you know, I've looked at it like we really 
until we have a vaccine, pretty much you have to live this way. Yeah. Make the best of it. I mean, you can. I'm going to keep doing the show as long as people want to be on. And we can. Mo- We're having fun, aren't we, Greg? I am having a blast. So I that's... sit here and I absorb a lot of. I hear a lot of stuff. I mean, when you mention stuff that I don't know about, like and we I'll always check get the out, you know? DM. I wish I would have said this this episode. We'll do it next time. Yeah. But this is very fun. Thanks. It's really good to see you. And I've seen your shows for many, many years. And I still remember the one thing in Seneca, the benefit show with the jugglers and everybody. That was loads of fun. Once I found it with my GPS, which... Yeah. You haven't <laughs> played Auburn until you've played the Ukrainian National Club. Uh-huh. Yeah. And the thing with Auburn... <laughs> what a blast. I had my GPS set for one gig. It was a Fox 45 gig. They moved... So I went down there, and somehow I found it. My big smartest thing was when I got up to the toll, it was Waterloo. And I said, well, I'm the Duke of Wellington who's Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> smartest that I I'll am. T- I'll tell you, there's a club in, uh, which is pretty much our home base club. There's a club in Auburn called Moon Dogs. That's where I was going to have my I'm going to have to go down best there. Best club. Oh, my God. The nicest people. So freaking supportive of live music. Nice little stage. House drum kit. House PA. Um, and just the best people. And, I, and mm. I can tell you one of the things dealing with my dad with dementia these years and when he passed, one of the things that always helped me was I would just pick a gig to go to and it would be upstate New York, you know, within four miles and go out there and enjoy it like that. I saw Michaela Davis at a show in just before this happened in Albany. But these little clubs like that, that's what I just hope and hope and hope they survive this. Yeah. That's what I can hope. We can just all we can do is you know you can only do what you can, and you just hope the best. Quick, but quick plug, if I may. No, that's what we're now. That's what we're all about. I, <laughs> I need hair plugs, but you guys plug stuff. Uh, right. um, I got asked by Krypton eighty eight to do their gigs while their drummer is kind of riding out the COVID thing because he has a compromised immune system, so he doesn't want to take any chances. That's, about, that's so about. anyway. So I'm doing a gig with them in Abilene on the twenty fifth or sixth. That's a Wednesday, whatever that is. So that should that should be fun. And if you've and never seen James V and them, um, they're rockabilly, lots, yep. loads of fun, loads of fun. We just and rehearsed. that's the best for him too because I think that's the number one thing is safety. You know, you don't yeah. want to mess with them. Danny, well, plug out to Danny. He's done. I've gone to a couple shows. He's done as much of a good job as you can. Do. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, he really is. I feel totally safe, it's, and it's up to everybody too how you feel. And he's one of the few guys that's really making it work. You know, yeah, it's so. fun to go there, and he gets the people to come out still. So you know, and bless them like that. But that's really good. Kim plugs. Yeah. Where do we get a hold of all your fun stuff here? Oh, friend me on Facebook and message. What are you going to do? I don't feel special than if you friend everybody. <laughs> eh, well, who said you were that special to begin with? I, huh? I, I, always, <laughs> I have a view on my life. The universe is here. You're here. You're shit. <laughs> and that's um, how I go through. You know the no, last. That, that's, that's, that, that's the best way to communicate. I do, and keep yeah. up with the band. And um, you know we're we, we're playing a couple of shows between now and the end of the year, and that's probably going to be it for us. We're playing October 9th and December fourth at, at Moon Dogs, and and probably just because it is Moon Dogs, and they're doing ticketed shows uh, at one third the capacity. Yes. And, now yeah. they can you go online. You have to call them. Say you're going to like say you're from like I'm from Rochester to go down there. Could you call them and print up your ticket or just say, hey, you know, put me on the list? And yeah, I, 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 I'm, they'll, they'll work with you uh, absolutely. They are they are the best. Um, yeah, that's great. And, gonna, and, and no, no disrespect to, to other club owners. I love Danny. Also, I love playing. Abilene. They're all good. They're all like our children. But yeah. you have one that's like your favorite. Yep. That's, and, and that, that's our home base, and it has been. Has been from the get go. I've never played that. I've only played Falcon and the Ukrainian Club and F and A's in that area. So uh, I, I went to shows, but I can't remember what the heck the place was. So. I, 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 I remember uh, about maybe two years ago, and we'd been playing there roughly every other month for a few years, and uh, we were we, it, no cover charge, and we were getting a three fifty guarantee, and we had a even better than usual night, and uh, uh, she came and paid us, gave us four hundred bucks, and I'm like. Oh, and I, I turned to Heidi and I said, "Oh, we got we got a fifty dollar bonus tonight." And Lynn, the owner, stopped in her tracks and she turned around. She goes, "That's not a bonus. That's what you guys." Yeah, get shout to out to Heidi who's now yeah. in Florida. Love and, and how many fairy. club owners decide out of the blue? Where is yeah. I will not name names, more than we but I've guys. been involved right. in some clubs. I remember a band came in from Winnipeg. And they screwed my other pay. There are places oh, like that. Oh, absolutely. I'm not going to yeah. names. We're not about that. But hi to Falcon Ferry, too, because she's in Florida now. Yeah. So bless you in Florida, too, at the moment. Stay safe. But it's up to you. You were our guest. Uh, would you like to play something from you? This is your latest album. 
pronounce it for me. Somebody sumus quad. Sumus quad sumus. We yeah. are what we are. Yes. <laughs> but would you just random track? Is we are kind of full of randomness? Or is this oh, uh, probably the um, uh, Zontar one. Who does not love Zontar and the thing mm. from Venus? So <laughs> this is. Are you a fan of the movie? Hopefully. Well, my my bass player is a big fan of of grade Z movies, and he mentioned. Zontar, the thing from Venus, and 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 so I started announcing that he he actually plays Zontar, um, which he doesn't. But um, and uh, so we have a we did an instrumental on one album called Love Theme from Zontar, <laughs> the thing from Venus, and then this one is the Return of the Son of Zontar or something. <laughs> and the lyrics for that, you know, I wanted something kind of spacey, kind of Hawkwindish when I wrote the song, and I thought, you know, I want kind of spacey lyrics. And everything I wrote just sounded stupid to me. Is that so, any San Ra? In- well, let me let me let me tell you how I wrote the lyrics. So everything I wrote just sounded stupid. And I thought, why can't I write some cool lyrics that sound like Sun Ra titles? And then I thought, well, wait a minute, that's what I'll do. I'll just I'll just write down a bunch of Sun Ra album titles and string them together, and that'll be the lyrics <laughs> to the is, song. Where else can you find Sun Ra mixed with the thing from Venus that looks like a giant carrot? <laughs> and, and and so the lyrics to that song, all it is is just Sun Ra album titles strung together. So we present right. you Zantar Beyond the Sunrise. And thank you very much, Kim and Greg. Yep. We'll be back with okay. more guests and more fun. Yep. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. Rock on. See you. Love.